All right. Cause of War Day 386. Lebanon War Day 40. You guys knew I'd be here tonight. You may have expected me yesterday, but there really wasn't enough information yesterday. Not that there's a whole lot of information tonight, but there's enough to talk about what happened. So this is, I'm, there's other stuff that happened. There was battles in the West Bank. There is an ongoing uh, aggression in Lebanon, massive bombing of certain villages on the border, causing to the point where Israel caused an earthquake. And they proudly said they blew up a tunnel by doing and in, in creating an earthquake. The, you may have seen the visuals from the sky. They were horrific. But what we are going to talk about tonight is the aggression on Iran and the aggression on Syria as well on the same night. And what I want to tell you is a few things. I just want to give you my thoughts on it because I'm seeing a couple of things that I think are a little bit incorrect. So I want to help to try to correct those. Okay. First of all, what happened? So Israel, the guy came out, the same guy who points to all the fake things and and can't tell the days of the week in Arabic and stuff, that guy. He came and said, I think it was that guy, they all look the same to me. But he said, um, like any sovereign country, we had to respond to um, Israel's, I mean, to Iran's previous attack in October, True Promise 2 which doesn't make any sense because Israel's not like any sovereign country whatsoever because sovereign countries have declared borders and they sovereign countries uh I think there are very few of them that are currently committing genocide right now uh, that are not in the Western Alliance that's committing this genocide right now sovereign countries um don't spit on international law and refuse to follow any international law and murder political opponents and torture and rape and have open debates on rape and um, maintain torture camps and attack hospitals. But for the fiction, for the sake of suspend your disbelief, he said, we have to respond also, not true. They're not retaliating, despite all the Western media saying they were retaliating. Uh, if you remember, Iran retaliated once in April for the attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria by Israel. Then they retaliated in October for the assassination of Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran. So this is a new aggression by Israel. And so... It started with a big lie, well, two big lies, which is on brand for Israel and Western sponsors who repeat all their lies. The other, the other thing that was really off brand in terms of Israel's behavior was that they said they were hitting military targets. And they said, we targeted military installations that had, were sources of attacks on us. This, that's, when I heard that, it was like word for word what Hezbollah said when they attacked a couple of Israeli bases. They attacked, I think, the Mossad headquarters. Remember that? The Glilot 8200, the base of U Unit 8200. They attacked a couple of these bases. And Nasrallah said these were bases that directly from which the assassinations of Fawad Shoker were planned and executed, right? It was an Air Force base and an intelligence base. And it was the same wording, like these were facilities that were used to hurt us, radars, air defense, and then military installations that they claimed to have hit or targeted. And that's not on brand for Israel at all. And I think they plagiarized the phrasing from Hezbollah, which makes sense. They copy everything, they steal everything, including the very phrasing of communications. They couldn't come up with their own phrasing. 
They'd have to plagiarize it from their enemies. So why do they target military installations? Okay, this the answer to this question, which I'm going to give you in a second, the answer to this question is the key to my personal opinion on what happened here. And... Um, let me, let, let's go through a few more facts, shall we? Because there's an interesting account, uh, Munir, I don't know Munir, I don't know, I, the first time I saw this account was last night, Munir, and the, the, um, handle is Janubi Syrian, J-N-O-U-B-I-S-Y-R-A-I-A-N, Janubi Syrian, don't know anything about it, but I saw this. And it said, apparently the Syrian anti the Syrian air defense made the Israeli fleets confused and disorganized before they reached Iran, which is why loud explosions were heard in Syria and North Lebanon. We saved Iran's ass so bad, lol. Who would have thought this had happened after all these weeks of talking about an Iranian attack only for Syria to foil it? The Syrian ADs and the Iranian ADs forced, forced them to cancel the attack before they lose their fleets. So that's a fascinating story and I, I do you know I would I'd like to say time will tell, but I don't actually think time will tell. Um I don't think time will tell. We may never know. It stands to reason that there would be an engagement of Syrian air defense. Uh what we what little we know of how the how the Israelis got there. Uh so here's Israel. I don't know that they flew over Syria. They don't necessarily have to, as you can see. I, I'm pretty sure, I'm quite sure they flew over Jordan. I'm quite sure they flew over Iraq. What we, what we know, or I don't, I wouldn't say close to, too close to know, uh, uh, but it seems like they took Jordan, Iraq, and launched their missiles from Iraq without actually flying into Iranian airspace. I think they were very worried about the possibility of their pilots getting captured, their planes getting shot down, as opposed to their missiles getting shot down. So they flew as far as the border with Iran, fired their missiles from Iraq. Remember, Iraq is occupied by the Americans and their airspace is open. Jordan is effectively a satrapy of America slash Israel. They, shoot, they were shooting down Iranian ordnance before and... Now they're facilitating uh, Israeli attack on Iran. No surprises there. They're going to get in some trouble with Iran over this, no doubt. Now, had if Israel had chosen to fly over Syria, which is possible but risky, given Syria has air defense and it has engaged Israeli planes and shot down lots of stuff from Israel. Israel is always bombing Damascus, but I, I understand that Israel bombs Damascus from Israeli territory or, uh, you know, flies over Lebanon, which doesn't have as much air defense as Syria. And of course, Iran has more air defense than anybody around there. Let's say I, I would give the Syria air defense playing a scrambling role, um, some credibility, not, I, I don't know for sure, but it's, it's certainly a believable possibility. Um, but this route, Jordan, Iraq, fire missiles, turn around and go home. This is, I think, something that the Iranians say happened and the, the Iraqis also say happened. So, uh, what one one account I I read sometimes says, F-15s, F-16s, F-35s take off from Hatsarim, Ramat David, and Ramon. They fly over U.S. controlled airspace in Jordan and Iraq. Ask yourself why the U.S. has airspace in Jordan and Iraq, and launch missiles towards their targets, staying a hundred kilometers from Iran's airspace. Okay, so that's um, that's what one that's what like I'd say the agreed upon 
account is. The Iran mission to the United Nations said two points. One, the Zionist regime's warplanes attacked several Iranian military and radar sites from Iraqi airspace, approximately 70 miles from Iran's border. Iraqi airspace is under the occupation, command, and control of the U.S. military. Conclusion, U.S. complicity in this crime is certain. Okay. There were casualties reported. Uh, video shows uh, pops in the sky. Cell phone videos that people took shows air defense being engaged. I didn't see any... Um, I didn't see any cell phone video of missiles hitting the ground, unlike October, when we saw lots of video of missiles hitting the ground, uh, Iranian missiles hitting occupied Palestinian ground at the Netzarim, Netzarim? Nev Nevatim? At the Nevatim airbase, whatever that airbase is called. So, Okay, where are we? Yes. So there were casualties. There were Iranian casualties. Four Iranian soldiers were killed. Presumably these were soldiers that were manning the air defense um, batteries, the air defense um, facilities, right? And which were hit the radar. Maybe they were at the radar. Okay. So let me talk about, here's another interesting account. It goes by Patar, Pataram, Patarames, Patar, Patarames. I don't know, I'm assuming it's an Iranian, um, so I'm going to pronounce it as if it's uh, Farsi. I don't know. I don't know that much Farsi. <laughs> I know, I know a little bit of, I know a little bit of Afghan Farsi, but I don't, I don't, I wouldn't exaggerate it, but I guess it would be Pata, Patarames. And Patarames says, very interesting thing uh, down here. He's saying today, Israel successfully demonstrated to Iran. This is a unique take. I did not see this take anywhere else today. Israel successfully demonstrated to Iran that it possesses a tactical nuclear weapon delivery system that can strike deep into Iran. That was the essence of this operation. To understand the context, the other Israeli nuclear weapon delivery system that could put successfully penetrate Tehran's air defense is the Jericho 2. Jericho 2 is not marved enough. I don't know what that means. To strike critical parts of deep tunnel complexes, it is not accurate enough. Non-marved Jericho 2 can't perform evasive maneuvers to defeat Iranian ballistic missile defense systems. And then he says... The conclusion is Israel lacks conventional firepower to enable its initial threat of de devastating response. Its retaliation was a capability display to Iran that its nuclear option is credible. I don't know. I don't know if showing that you can, it wasn't, there was no saturation, right? There was a lot of successful engagement of air defense. The Israelis, um, if they were going to nuke, I think if they were going to do a nuclear strike, that would be what they call, they like to call the Samson option after the Bible story of Samson who brought the whole temple down on everybody. It's one of the things they love. They love the idea of killing everybody. I don't remember who Samson killed. I did read the Bible a couple of times, um, but I don't remember who Samson killed. He killed everybody and he killed himself, right? This is Bible story of Samson and Delilah. And Samson killed everybody and he killed himself because he was so strong and he ripped the pillars out and he killed everybody. So Israel, because they like their Bible stories, they like the story because it, it's a story of how they killed themselves to kill everybody. And that's what they're willing to do because they're just that tough. So if they were in a nuclear situation where they wanted to nuke Iran, I think they'd also be willing to risk their pilots and they'd fly into Iranian airspace and they'd take those casualties because they're going to nuke Iran. And then we're going to change the world because Iran's going to nuke them back and we're going to become a world that where nuclear weapons are used freely. And then there's going to be nuclear winter and... um we're not going to survive as a species. So 
I don't think that that's quite right. I also don't think that showing that you have a missile that can land on the ground shows a nuclear capability. There's a lot of not a lot. I've seen the I've seen people express the opinion that Israel. I think it was in these comments actually. I think it was in the comments. If you if you were the person that commented, you can you can tell the story again if you if you don't mind. Um, but someone in the comments here said Israel's never done a nuclear test, so they have nuclear technology. But if you have nuclear which they stole, you know, they got from South Africa, they got from Jonathan Pollard, who, look up Jonathan Pollard, trust me, you'll enjoy it if you don't know this story. But if they have these technologies, it doesn't necessarily mean they have a bomb. Maybe they make the bomb in Demona. We know that they, we think they made the bomb in Demona because of, um, Mordecai Vanunu, also a story, a hell of a story for Mordecai Vanunu. Mordecai Vanunu is, I think, still kind of under some kind of house arrest or something. I'm not sure what Mordecai Vanunu's status is, but look him, look him up. He's he's a fascinating story and and a you know a tragic story. Not a not a complete tragedy because it was a very brave whistleblower and and um, you know. And he he sacrificed a lot and lost a lot to bring the world the information on the Israeli nuclear program. So what's the point of this? The point of this is the nuclear a nu to show nuclear capability, you kind of have to show nuclear capability in in my view. So as a matter of logic, I don't doubt that Patarames has more knowledge than me about missiles. Uh, and what they can do. But as a matter of logic, I don't know that this is a demonstration of nuclear capability. I, it's hard for me to to grasp. Maybe it's too subtle for me, but I don't entirely grasp it. Okay. One last take because of who it is and because it's a really interesting take as always. And I always recommend Ali Jazini. But Ali Jazini has been doing a couple of long threads since the attack yesterday. And he says, uh, he did a long thread last night. He said, aside from mocking the Israeli response, which we need in light of this difficult battle, we can highlight several points about what happened. The Israelis used several aero-ballistic missiles of the Rock's 300-kilometer range and the Golden Horizon long-range Blue Sparrow type to attack several military targets. Let me translate the next one. In the picture, rocket booster of one of the Golden Horizon separates and the warhead continues on its way to the target. No manned aircraft entered uh, Iranian airspace. Perhaps some undeclared low radar signature drones or aircraft operated by sabotage teams. The damage so far is minimal. The battle here is not a battle of image, but a battle over the fate of the region. So it doesn't, he's saying it doesn't make a lot of sense. It is clear the Israelis took the logical choice of trying not to expand the war to Iran at the present time. I'll give you my take on this in a second. Uh, and this proves their objective fear of the harm that Iran could cause them at this stage. They apparently preferred to continue with the strategy based on confining the battle to Gaza and Lebanon and practicing strategic deception as in the past period in Lebanon. Last year, opening a front with Lebanon was delayed until the Gaza front was completed with promises of calm and limited battle until we reached where we are now. Repeated, the war will not stop until Israel is forced to do so. It seems that what it is doing now is a strategic deception in terms of deluding the Iranians that the solution is near as long as they do not respond and it will suffice with destroying the offensive installations on the border in, in Lebanon. But the believer is not bitten from the same hole four times that it is supposed to be. I'm sure this is an idiom that is being translated automatically by Google. It is true that Israel lacks the ability to wage war with Iran without America. Well, Iran, Israel, and America are the same thing. What if several strikes were carried out over several days, during which Iran succeeded in disabling the Israeli Air Force and perhaps the economy? I do not imagine the Israeli nuclear option would be far off here, so an Iranian nuclear bomb becomes a necessity. Currently, there does not seem to be an Israeli ability to expand operations in Lebanon. 
but it makes no sense for them to stop now as long as the harm is tolerable and none of the war's objectives are achieved. This is a war to change the Middle East. There is a lot of logic in the vision that prefers to keep Iran out of the war because it is the factory of the Axis and its heart and the problem is not with it. But if there is someone who still believes that Israeli goals are limited, once it is accepted that the Israelis will not stop the war except under duress, Either through fear or attrition, the strategy can be decided based on that. Whether it is through shocking qualitative strikes or a war of attrition, no problem. The basic false idea that prevailed in the past period was that war can be avoided. The previous assumptions that the U U.S. did not want to get too involved in this war and did not want a regional war are still correct. Mm, don't think so. And after, But after the Black Monday and bigger strikes, it applauded Israel because it saw these strikes as relatively low cost and productive as they saw it at the time and they could have pushed Hezbollah to collapse. Currently, Hezbollah has largely gained its balance and effectiveness. I would not say its health. This will take years, but none of Israel's dilemmas will be solved except it's through its elimination. The Israelis may deceive and claim weakness here as they did before, while Hochstein comes to us promising, but this will not change anything. Currently, I do not believe that Iran will refrain from responding unless the war is stopped. No promises, just stopping. But based on the above, I do not see any motive for the Israelis to currently do so unless they suffer much greater damage to military economy and society in terms of damage to the army or factories or a decrease in support for the war. This post is not pessimistic. On the contrary, I'm optimistic, but I try to remove any false hopes that some people plant in people so that they are disappointed and frustrated later. I'm not saying there's no possibility of the war stopping, but I do not see any signs of that. The Israeli goal is to separate the fronts and isolate each front. The goal of the Axis is to break Israel and push it to stop the war. Okay, that's pretty good. And I like a lot of what Ali, uh, I mean, I don't, it's not a matter of whether I like it or not, but I, I think what, there's a lot of truth in what Ali Jazini is saying here. One last thing before I give you my take, okay, you guys? Um, the Iranians actually made a statement, um, an official statement, where they said we have we have the right under Article we are have the we are entitled under Article fifty one of the Charter, the UN Charter, to respond, to retaliate, and we have the obligation. So they said we have the entitlement and the obligation that's the language they used in their statement to respond and that means they likely are going to respond legal and legitimate right to respond the foreign minister said to the secretary general but there was a longer letter the iranians said provided and it had something that I think is really important, which is, you know, what you might call linkage. And it's not a strong linkage, but it is. it was, in my opinion, a kind of a linkage where they said, they said, we have the obligation to defend ourselves, but we want you... Yeah, okay, there it is. So this is from the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Iran. And they said, while reserving the right to respond legally and appropriately at the right time, Iran emphasizes the importance of establishing a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza and Lebanon to prevent the massacre of innocent and unarmed people. So that was like in one sentence. And that's, I think, pretty powerful there. And that reinforces, or I mean, is likely the source of what Ali Jazini was saying. Ali Jazini was saying, if Israel stops the war today, Iran probably won't, won't bomb them. They'll, un why would they? Everything they want, you know, the, the objective of the axis is, uh, and, you know, the minimalist objective of the axis of resistance is an end to the aggression on Gaza. And Yemen's put their own little extra thing of the an end to the blockade. But Hamas's end to the aggression, exchange of prisoners, 
and to the blockade, right? Those are the basics. Those are the war aims. And Israel, war aims are continue the war, kill everybody, kill everything in our path, show them who's boss, kill the prisoners, torture people, reopen the debate on rape. I mean, <laughs> reopen. I don't know. Was there a debate on rape? They opened it, I guess. The So this linkage, this idea that the Iranians are once again reminding everybody that this is about Gaza, it's uh it's good um but like how how will that how will they take that into account in their military response and uh and how does this lead to or what you know what happens next okay now let me give you my take i think you're ready <laughs> i've prepared you now I do not believe that Israel just did a performative attack. I do not believe this was a symbolic attack. I do not believe this was a limited attack. I do not believe the Americans made them do it as a limited attack. I do not believe they meant to do it as a limited attack. I do not believe they were um, trying to prevent the Iranians from retaliating. I think they could. They they think the Iranians are stupid, just like they think all of us are stupid. And so there there is always an element of deception and there is there are always tricks in the works, right? They they might have a pager attack type of black swan terrorist thing that they're they're working towards right now in Iran, even as we speak, right? But what I think is that they tried to do something really big last night. And I think they were trying to do it. I do think that they were surprised and displeased by what they found in terms of Iranian and possibly Syrian air defense. And I believe that they are downplaying and rewriting the history in real time to try to minimize how difficult a task they took on, how hard they tried to do the task, and how unsuccessful they were because of Iran's successful missile defense. Iran has been developing missile defense as long as Iran has been developing missiles. And Russia and Iran have adapted to Western air supremacy over decades by developing standoff missile capacities. Iran does also develops these capacities in their allies and by developing excellent air defense, layered air defense. And Russia has that and Iran has that. And people talk about Russia. You guys might remember that Russia had this shipment of maybe the latest and greatest Russian systems. We can probably Russia is a generation ahead of Iran on because they're a generation ahead of everybody in terms of their air defense complex, right? The famous S-400. But um, Iran is right there, right behind them. Iran has equivalents to the S-300. Iran has local anti-missile industrial complex that is excellent. And let us also remember, let us remember that Israel is very small and Iran is very big. The size of the territory is 
also reflected in the size of pop the population. Iran is many times bigger in terms of population than Israel. Israel, and let us remember how far it is. Israel has to fly. Saudi Arabia said, no, you're not using our space. Syria is going to try to shoot you down if you use their space. Turkey, I don't remember, but I don't think Turkey was going to allow them to use their airspace. So this is their this is their thing. This is the strip that they could take through U.S. controlled um, colonies, neo colonies. I mean, colonies. I don't know what else can you call them. They don't have sovereignty. The U.S. controls them. Um, this was the path they could take. They did not want to fly over Iran, too risky, and then they had to fly all the way back. So this was their this was their path. Iran sent missiles they didn't send fighter jets or bomb fighter bombers or whatever they sent missiles and iran has been this is iran's specialty israel's specialty as you know is bombing refugee camps schools hospitals and civilian targets with american dropped american provided weaponry and terror like you know spectacular terrorist attacks using the American and Western supply chain, like the pager and walkie-talkie attacks. So Israel was trying to do something that it's not very good at, trying to do it far from their usual targets, and trying to do it against the specialty of Iran, or one of the two specialties of Iran. So it is believable that they could have pulled out a lot of the stops as far as this attack and not succeeded. They very likely underestimated what Iran has in the way of missile defense, and they may not have known. People, I saw somebody say, like, if they were more serious, they would have launched more missiles to do saturation of the air defense. But... I don't, I know they have satellite and they have Intel. They have, they're obsessed with Iran. Of course they have sources in Iran, but do they have, how good is their Intel? How well do they know what Iran has in terms of effective missile defense? The only way to know, the only way to find that out is the only way to find that out is to attack Iran. And that is the only real way to test your enemy's military that this is something we've known for hundreds of years. You you want to test how good a military is, you have to, you only find that out in a war. And I think they probably had a range of possibilities for how good Iran was. And I think they probably found that they were on the higher end of their, that, that line. The higher end of that continuum of air defense ability. So if they were going to do a bigger attack, which I suspect was their plan, they would have done one layer, they would have done one wave and another wave and another wave. And instead they said it's over after the first two waves. They did some terrorist attacks inside Iran too at that same time, which they've done over the years over the years, several times, including the assassination of Ismail Haniya himself. That was a attack. That was a terrorist attack by a team of people using a missile inside of Iran. So that's what I that's my take. My take is they they went big. It doesn't look like they went big. They weren't doing a performance. This wasn't a warning. This is not that's not what Israel does. Israel doesn't do any of that stuff. Israel was trying to do a big attack and it didn't work out because of Iranian air defense. That's what I think. Now, what happens now? Is Iran going to be strategically deceived? Is Iran going to do a small attack back? Is Iran going to do a big attack and continue the demilitarization of Israel? The, the, 
the logic for me right now that Iran, I think, I imagine would be contending with is that the only member of the axis of resistance that can do real demilitarizing damage to Israel is Iran. Um, Hezbollah is going to do attritional damage to Israel, but his Lebanon is going to take massive damage in the process, and they ha already have. And if that continues, if that continues for long enough to attrit the Israeli army, their Lebanon will be in a shambles, and will ha basically have suffered a genocide as well uh, by the end of that process. Gaza is beyond an emergency status. The North is being ethnically cleansed. The starvation is back. They are using all methods of genocide to come to, to against the people of Gaza. They've isolated people in North Gaza for the final solution. And then if that succeeds, they'll create another pocket and they'll do the same thing. And that is also the only way to stop that is through the def the comprehensive defeat of the Israeli military. And the contribution of the Palestinian resistance to this has been immense by surviving and by administering the so-called death by a thousand cuts. But as far as the qualitative strikes, as to use Ali Jazini's words, that's on Iran. Um, Yemen can has enforced the economic blockade and Yemen will, again, on a longer timeline, Yemen will, Yemen alone could destroy the Israeli economy on a long enough timeline. But the question, the strategic question is for Iran to face is how much time is there before Israel wins by genocide alone um, or before Israel has the next big trick or what? Um, can, can the nuclear, can the risk of the Israeli Samson option and the US nuclear war, can that be What's the word? Does that mean that the axis of resistance has to allow the genocide to continue for as long as it takes to for Israel to collapse? Because escalation means an inevitable nuclear war on Iran itself. Um, I don't know. I, I, that's the, that's where we are now. That's, these are the, these are the calculations that Iran has to make as they're deciding how to re retaliate. I think if they do make um, a demilitarizing qualitative strike on Israel, then, you know, that will, that will, change the uh, change the nature of the war it could potentially change the nature of the war but it could also yes it could also end up with a nuclear exchange the, the question is you know if israel has successfully cowed the axis of resistance and the whole rest of the world into allowing them to proceed with their genocide then we're already in 
that kind of scary world where Israel runs things, right? If the brandishing of the nuclear threat means they get to do genocide where they want, then I would say they've won already in a way. Um, so those seem to be the, the Iranian options now. Attrition. Attrition until Israel collapses. A big qualitative strike to try to speed that up and risk and higher risk of increase the risk of this going nuclear well those are the two because <laughs> surrender they're not going to surrender obviously um nobody's surrendering so and israel doesn't accept surrenders so really those are the two options attrition continue on the path of attrition which has this tremendous cost in terms of Israel's capacity to commit genocide continuing or continue or escalate and hope that that speeds up the collapse of Israel. Once upon a time, we might have hoped that diplomacy or some recognition of these costs to the Americans could have led to forcing Israel to stand down, but those illusions have long since died. And so those, it's, it's pretty stark. It's a pretty stark set of options that Iran faces. And between those two, I suspect Iran's going to escalate. They have already said they have. They've announced their martyrs that they've lost for people. They know what Lebanon is facing. They know that Iran, they know the perfidy of the US and of Israel. And they know the probability of strategic deception in this whole uh, war. So I suspect a fairly cautious escalatory strike is what what's in in the plan and we'll see what happens there um as far as lebanon goes you probably have seen that there have been um a lot of damage inflicted i mean again a lot of damage uh in 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 the sense of still death by a thousand cuts territory but deeper cuts than than uh Hassan, hamas is able to make Hassan. i turned Hamas and Qassam and Hassam, then, then Qassam has been able to do in Gaza much deeper, um, more tanks, more troops killed, more groupings of troops and missiles into the Israeli depth again. So the Lebanon front is, is proceeding like that. And uh, I've, I've seen one, uh, Alon Mizrahi actually says that he thinks that there's going to be a big uh, they're going to try for the big invasion. I still think they might try for the big invasion too. But uh, for now, they're just on the border getting getting that death by a thousand cuts and inflicting genocidal violence on the unarmed people of Lebanon. So that's um that's the Israeli attack. the The one other thing, the other the one other dynamic that I think could happen is since Israel has been threatening this for many years, right? Every chance Netanyahu gets in every public forum, he says, Iran is the problem. Iran is our problem. We're not safe because of Iran. Everything goes back to Iran. Iran is the head of all this, right? And so the whole idea was one day we're going to hit Iran. You know, we're not going to be safe until we hit Iran. So they hit Iran now. I hope they feel safe now. I wonder if they do. But they've hit Iran. Iran sh showed a, six, a fairly successful defense ability. And now that they both sides know this, and Iran knows this, Iran has a better idea of what's going to come their way and how. It may embolden Iran to give 
for example, answer Allah more things, to give the Syrians more things, to give Hezbollah more things, knowing that all this talk of how it all goes back to Iran is, you know, what that leads to is this this type. If, if what that leads to is this type of attack, which the Iranians seem to have handled quite well in terms of air defense, well, then... Um, then Iran will be emboldened uh, to potentially speed up the attritional war. And maybe Israel will face a couple more Palestine missiles with more frequency hitting Tel Aviv from Yemen, for example. So maybe that's a third option. Which means then we have three. We have escalated, sp some speeding up of the attrition, some escalatory strike in, in the form of a strike on their factories and other facilities in Israel, or a continuation of attrition and kind of a faith that that will lead to the eventual defeat of Israel and a ceasefire with reconstruction and an end to the blockade and an exchange of prisoners, which were Hamas's war aims from the beginning. There will be much more to uh, talk about in the coming days, so hang in there. Please like and subscribe. We're, we're doing tanky therapy tomorrow, hopefully, so watch for that in the evening. All right, take care, guys.